because he uh, he changed his mind. And so the, you see these cycles develop uh, through uh, Canadian history in which you have uh, one prime minister will establish a closer relationship and another will want to uh, move back. And again, it's keeping that a certain degree of distance, you know, not too close, not too far. That's been the the guiding principle, I think, in the relationship. Well, you know, I think, again, we have a tendency to look at those two people and say this was about kismet, that there was a meeting of the minds here. In fact, there was a very specific problem that is very interesting in terms of today's environment. In 1981 and 82, we had a major recession in North America. There was pressure from the United States Congress, quite interestingly led by the steel lobby, to... Uh, close down U.S. markets, to deny access, to use public spending to buy American if you want. The challenge uh, to the Mulroney administration was to find a way to secure access to the U.S. market to make sure those forces of protectionism didn't win the day and the Canadian economy wasn't harmed. We worried about collateral damage. We worried about the importance of access to the U.S. market. So what Mr. Mulroney did is use that political um, leverage to you know, basically find a way to get the free trade deal done. So I think what we see there is a very specific political strategy based on a very particular set of interests. Whether we agree it was a good thing or a bad thing, uh, you know, Mr. Mulroney had a very specific political agenda and he pursued it. And he believed that one of the best ways to do that was to cozy up to Mr. Reagan and, and use that political leverage. Because remember, in the United States, you essentially have two big forces here, often at odds. The Congress tends to be sensitive to local constituency interests, to special interest groups, to trade unions, whereas the administration, the president, tends to be the voice of free trade, of, of internationalism, and is looking after the greatest good for the greatest number. So I think the Mulroney people simply saw that as an opportunity to promote their interests in the place where they made the most sense. Canada and the United States reached the Free Trade Agreement on October 4, 1987. It was the most controversial agreement of its kind in Canadian history. There were supporters and there were opponents. Bob White, the Canadian Auto Workers Union president, called it ludicrous. He said it meant Canada would lose its political sovereignty in deciding its future. It'll mean we're moving towards a Rambo, dog-eat-dog -dog survival of the fittest society but other Canadians embraced it. A year later, Canadians went to the polls. Free trade became the sole election issue. The climax of the campaign came at the leaders' debate. The Globe and Mail headlines read, Turner, PM, turned trade deal into scrap over patriotism. In an extraordinary exchange between the federal party leaders, the signing of the free trade agreement sparked a bitter argument over patriotism. I happen to believe that you've sold us out. I resent the fact that your implication that only you were a Canadian. I, I want to tell you that I come from a Canadian once, family and I love Canada. The Conservatives held on to their majority and free trade was adopted. Later, it was superseded by the North American Free Trade Agreement, which included Mexico. The business community increasingly was of the view that the relationship with the United States was so critical to their future that we could not continue to do things on the basis that had been done in the past. And the solution that the government had found in the past was to negotiate relations with the United States in Geneva, multilaterally, through the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, with witnesses present. And what the business community was basically saying, and a number of economists agreed with them, and officials were also of that view, uh, that while that had been very helpful to Canada in the post-war years, we had reached the stage by the mid-80s where the nature of trade, the intensity of it, the, the problems that we were beginning to experience were not going to be solved in Geneva. They had to be negotiated bilaterally between the two countries, and that can only be done through the framework of a free trade agreement. I think it's 
hard to evaluate the the impact of the free trade agreement. First of all, before the free trade agreement, we were already entering into deeper and deeper economic integration with the United States anyways. The free trade agreement was not something completely new. It was just an, another stage in that process. We were, were going that direction anyways. Uh, secondly, it's hard to separate what has happened with uh, the free trade agreement and NAFTA from what's happening in the world generally from the forces of globalization. It underpinned a massive restructuring of the Canadian economy, uh, a massive reorientation of the Canadian economy from east-west to north-south. Uh, I think it underpinned the prosperity of the 1990s and early uh, 21st century. Uh, there are now growing pains that we're going to have to deal with, uh, but they are the growing pains of success rather than of failure. On January 20th, 1989, George Bush became the 41st President of the United States. Brian Mulroney was the Prime Minister of Canada. Like Bush's predecessor, Ronald Reagan, Mulroney became fast friends with the President. The mark of a good relationship is, is that the leaders respect each other, they trust each other, and they actually look to each other for advice. Although much has been made of the Mulroney-Reagan relationship, in some ways, I think the more important relationship was between Mulroney and uh, George Bush Sr., who succeeded Reagan as president. Uh, because there, 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 there was a... President Bush had an enormous healthy respect uh, for the Canadian Prime Minister. And he respected his judgment. Um, he turned to him for advice. Uh, there's the famous story that's told that uh, prior uh, to uh, uh, Bush's decision to uh, uh, this send uh, U.S. forces to oust uh, Iraqi uh, troops uh, from Kuwait in, in uh, what we now refer to as the first Gulf War, um, he, uh, he, he first called Margaret Thatcher and said, um, uh, uh, how should I deal with this? Should I go to the United Nations and get their approval? And how should I deal with the French? Uh, French President uh, François Mitterrand, who uh, may not like this idea. And the French, of course, were also permanent members of the Security Council. And Margaret Thatcher's advice was, you just go ahead and do it, uh, we'll support you and uh, damn the Security Council. Um, it just so happened that uh, Bush had invited uh, uh, the Canadian Prime Minister uh, and his wife uh, down to uh, uh, the Maine compound. He had a summer house in Maine. Uh, and uh, he ran this by Mulroney. And Mulroney said, that's a terrible idea. Uh, you should pick up the phone. You should call Mitterrand. Uh, I can help you with that, uh, you know, to, to sort of pave the way. And you should also get the approval of the Security Council, because if you don't, the international community will be against you. And it's not in America's interest to be essentially uh, 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 snubbing uh, uh, the world community uh, in uh, undertaking to uh, invade uh, a country, uh, albeit to uh, uh, restore its uh, territorial integrity. And uh, Bush accepted that advice and, uh, and did so, uh, I think, very much to the American advantage and the national interest. And I think that's, that's only one illustration of, of the kind of relationship those two leaders had. And uh, it's interesting if you look at uh, the Bush Scrowcroft memoirs, these are a series of memoirs he wrote with his national security advisor, Brent Scrowcroft. In the index, there are more references to Brian Mulroney than there are to any other national leader. And, uh, and I think that's, that's symptomatic uh, or illustrative of what was clearly a relationship of great mutual respect. On October 25th, 1993, it was a liberal landslide. Tory blue was almost erased from the Canadian political landscape. The party went from 157 seats to just two. Voters chose Jean Chrétien as their new leader. Throughout the 1993 election campaign, he made it clear he was not going to follow Mulroney's lead and be close friends with the President of the United States. Yet he enjoyed what some called a chummy relationship with Bill Clinton. He confessed, when we're alone, said Chrétien, I call him Bill. I also want to thank Canada again for what I think is 
very probably the most cooperative relationship in the world in trade and investment and the work we do in the environment and law enforcement. And I hope that as we look ahead to the new century that the partnership that we've had, the cooperation we've had, will be a genuine model that other countries will try to follow. Kretsan told an aide, 